Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Will, welcome to the Australian Investors Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always good to chat small companies, emerging companies and these types of things. Um, I know it's like probably the number one thing when I look at downloads, seeing uh, all of the names of companies and uh, emerging businesses in particular, because I kind of have this mystique about them. Um, a first question I want to ask you, and I know I'm going to be dating the podcast a little bit, but it's it's been a little over a year since April last year when um, you took over the Early Small Companies Fund, and the track record is very good. So as of May 2024, the fund has returned 16% uh, since inception, compared to the index return of 8.3%. I remember I'll start there. Um, that seems like a pretty good way to start out. Yeah, look, we're um, we're super super happy with the performance so far. Um, you know, it's obviously still early days, though. I would say, and you know, at early we like to take a long term view in investing. You know, we're really thinking about businesses on a three to five year view, and so you know, I'd say it's best to judge our performance over you know a similar time frame. But you know, nonetheless, we're we're super happy with this stuff. Yeah. Um, how did you how did you come to be involved in investing? Like a lot of the times when we trace people's I guess, background to investing, it's really interesting because you see things play over or you see like early experiences shape the investor that they are. So how did you get into it? Yeah, look, um, my dad's a, a stockbroker. Um, he's worked out and run various broking businesses um, around Sydney. I've actually also got an uncle uh, who's also a stockbroker. So, you know, I very much grew up, you know, surrounded by my finance, hearing a lot about the stock market. Um, I've also actually got two elder brothers who both work at different funds. So there's Tom who runs the Wattle Fund at Anacacia and Sam who started Equity Mini Partners. And so, you know, my brothers both loved their jobs. They're really passionate about investing. And so I always had it, um, you know, something I was keen to try and, and see if it works for me as well. Um, one of my brothers actually was, was kind enough to give me some investing books while I was still studying. And, you know, I went down that rabbit hole and, and you know, really, really got hooked on investing and, you know, I think the thing that struck me initially about investing, the more I learned about it, was that having the right temperament, so being patient and rational, um, is perhaps the most important thing you can bring to the the investing game. And I thought that was a really sort of novel and, and interesting idea. And you know, so I was hooked on it. Um, I studied commerce at, at Sydney Uni and um, was lucky enough to then get a job at a small boutique fund manager named Kiss Capital while I was finishing my degree. So that was back in 2016. Um, you know, KISS was a long short fund. Um, you know, it was a great team and I really learned a lot working there. And I think once I got into the role, um, you know, I really loved uh, the art of actually investing. You know, I think there's a lot to like about investing. There's a lot of variety. You know, you're always looking at new companies and new industries. Uh, you're always learning. Um, you know, I think it's a job that really rewards curiosity and, and I like that. Um, and I think KISS was probably a really good place to start as well because it was the kind of place that wasn't you know, overly prescriptive about how you should think about investing. Um, you know, you, I really had a long leash to go and develop my own investment philosophy and, um, you know, after a bit of trial and error and, and more of my fair share of mistakes, I, um, I think I really gravitated towards the idea of buying uh, quality businesses and, and not overpaying. You know, that seemed like the best strategy for making money in, in the long run. Mm. It's interesting because normally when you go to a, like a family barbecue, like the cliche, you, if you're in investing, you're typically like the one uh, only person in the family that wants to talk about finance or investing, except for like that, the random uncle that's like there or, you know, the family friend that happens to have a share portfolio or something like this. Whereas with you, it's very, very, very different. I don't think I've ever met someone who is literally surrounded by investors. Yeah, it is. Um, I think it is pretty unique. Um, I got a bit of sympathy for my mom and my sister uh, who... Yeah, I'm really in finance. I mean, my sister actually works in HR at a fund manager. So technically, she's, she's in there as well. But um, yeah, I think it is pretty unique. And I think that's one of the things I've been really fortunate is, is having that, um, you know, that network. Um, you know, you get to learn vicariously through your, your siblings and your family and it really accelerates up the learning curve. Yeah, because then you can like, I don't know, I'm just imagining a day out when you were younger, just like thinking about the businesses that you might come across, a cafe, a 
I don't know, a day out at the park or you see something like you can talk in the same language. It's just really cool. It's kind of like your own um, kind of lexicon at home uh, that only you guys would get, which is, which is great. So Airly launched the, the Small Companies Fund last year, uh, 2023. Um, your background is quite unique. You mentioned it there, like a long short fund, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's like a very unique skill set. In, in particularly when it comes to smaller companies, like to come from that and then go to this. I, I'm curious, like what Airly as a whole, but also you, like saw like the attraction of small cap investing, uh, small cap as a product, like launching the fund. Um, obviously, Airly's got a huge pedigree in Australian equities and um, the brand is like, you know, revered by peers and stuff like that. So I'm curious, like why small caps and for you in particular as well? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I guess for me, so I probably spent the majority of my time at KISS looking at small companies. You know, it's really where I cut my teeth in the market. And I personally found it, I thought it was a great, great market to look at because it's this really, you know, broad market. Um, there's this massive investment universe and you've got the prospect of going and finding these, um, you know, really novel and hidden treasures uh, in that index. And so that I found really exciting. Um uh, in terms of early, it's interesting actually. The, the my link to early, you know, most people probably associate early with either John Sevio, who co-founded the business, or Matt Williams, who's the head of equities. But actually, my introduction to early was through Emma Fisher. Um, I remember oh, cool. seeing, yeah, I remember seeing a recording of her pitching Reese at the Sign Hearts and Minds conference, and I thought it was a fantastic pitch. You know, it hit everything I like to see in an investment idea. Um, you know, it was a great business with brilliant family-led management, uh, long runway to deploy capital. Um, and, you know, it was, it was pretty true to the rest of the sort of early, you know, pragmatic common sense approach to investing. And so I'd always had that in the back of my mind as a place I wanted to work. And then I got lucky enough to get hired there. Um, worked at early for, for three and a half years is, or four and a half years, um, mostly as an analyst. And then we decided to launch this, this fund. And, you know, I think the obviously we launched the fund last year, but really the genesis of the product sort of well predates that. Um, you know, small cap investing isn't new early. Um, we've spent a lot of time successfully investing in small caps as a team as part of our other funds and mandates. And, you know, some of those small cap names that we uncovered um, were actually, you know, some of our best performers uh, in our other funds. So, you know, we really thought it was a natural extension to then go and launch, you know, a product that was focused on that subset of the market and, and really leverage that existing work. Um, so we're keen to launch it and, you know, the opportunity in small caps is, is fantastic. You can find these amazing businesses with, um, you know, decades of growth ahead of them. Um, you know, it's a deep market as I talked about and, you know, some as well covered as, as large caps. So, you know, we thought there was a real opportunity to go on and buy our sort of, you know, large cap robustness and small cap market and, and yeah, keep finding some good opportunities. Yeah. And it was a great time to launch because for folks that aren't as you know, familiar as you or I, perhaps, um, the background is like small caps were punished for quite a while as interest rates started to rise. And um, then you guys launched the fund and it's off, like I said before, it's off to a great start uh, since inception. So can you talk us through, let's start at the top, let's start at investment philosophy or investment process, however you want to think about what comes first. Um, and talk us through like how do you end up with a portfolio of companies that are high quality that can, you know, you can take that three to five year view on? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the fund uses the same early investment process that we use across all of our, all of our funds. And, um, really there's four factors to that. Um, we start by analyzing financial strength, business quality, management quality before then going to a conclusion as to valuation. We don't think you can value your business until you've assessed those first three. Yeah, so, you know, taking a bit of a, a deeper dive into those, um, you know, financial strength, um, you know, we're really talking about two things when we're talking about financial strength. We're talking about the quality of the balance sheet, and then we're talking about the resilience of the earnings of the business. Um, so, in terms of balance sheet, of course, we're using metrics like net debt to EBITDA, net debt to EBIT, interest coverage ratios. But, you know, it's not a one size fits all analysis. You really have to contextualize that balance sheet um, against the quality of the earnings, you know, some businesses with more resilient earnings can comfortably take on more gearing. So, you know, for example, I wouldn't consider a retailer with one times net debt to EBITDA um, as necessarily financially strong given the, you know, operating leverage and 
uh, fragility of that sort of business model, but I might consider a toll road, the same amount of leverage. It's actually undergeared given how resilient those earnings streams are. So yeah, it's really idiosyncratic analysis based on the company and, and industry. Um, and we also sort of view financial strength as sort of like a gateway hurdle in our investment process. So, you know, it's the one thing we won't compromise, even if you've got you know, the best business quality in the world, with the best management team, um, you know, with the cheapest valuation. If there are question marks around the balance sheet, then really all bets are off and there's no downside protection there. So we don't compromise on that part of the investment process. Um, moving over to uh, business quality and really with business quality, we're talking about businesses with durable competitive advantages. Um, you know, so those businesses that are protected from competition and can grow at really attractive rates on incremental capital. And, um, and really the hero metric here is businesses return on invested capital. You know, competition theory tells us that uh, capital chases high returns. So a business that um, has a long track record of generating very attractive returns on capital likely possesses some sort of competitive advantage. Um, and so we want to go and understand that competitive advantage, to try and work out whether it can continue into the future. Um, you know, that involves doing a lot of um, sort of forensic analysis of the business, its accounts, looking at competitors and the industry structure. You know, we often find that some of the best insights that you get uh, from looking at business actually come from looking at their competitors. You know, I remember um, looking at Bunnings back in the day and, you know, perhaps the best indication of its competitive advantage wasn't necessarily its own fantastic track record, uh, but rather the track record of competitor um, masters. You know, there you had a very well-backed, um, well-funded competitor in Masters, which was funded by Woolies. And, you know, after five years of operations and you know, close to a billion dollars in cumulative losses, they had to exit the market. So there you have an example of a competitive advantage that's been very well tested, and that gives us great confidence in the quality of that business. And, you know, we found a huge opportunity in going and applying, you know, that sort of analysis to the small cap market, which isn't really as well covered as, as large caps. Um, moving over to management quality, really here, um, the focus is finding founder-led or owner-managed businesses. So you know, management with material skin in the game, we're going to prioritize long-term decision-making and shareholder-friendly capital management. Um, you know, I think one of the great things about investing in public markets is that you get to be silent partners with these really fantastic entrepreneurs. You know, I look at our portfolio and you know, we own businesses like Nick Scully, um, which is really a testament to you know, the benefits of fantastic management. You know, furniture retailing in and of itself isn't a remarkable business, but if you look at Nick Scala, it's got one of the best track records of value creation for shareholders of, you know, really any listed business. Had you bought Nick Scala 20 years ago and reinvested all of your dividends, you'd have, you know, more than 25 times your initial capital. And that's more than 10 times the return of of the market uh, of the small odds index over that same, same period. So, you know, that really comes down largely to, the fantastic management and, and capital allocation of Anthony Scully. Um, so it's really hard to sort of understate the importance or overstate the importance of um, really high quality management. I look at our portfolio and we've got something like 55% of our portfolio invested in what I deem owner managed or founder led businesses. So, you know, we're aligned with our management teams and they're creating value for themselves and us as, as shareholders. Um, so that's management quality. And then the final piece is, is valuation. So it's it's not enough to go and find you know, the best businesses in the world. Um, you really have to find a situation in which the quality of that business isn't reflected in the share price. And you know, ultimately, um, in terms of valuation, you know, the intrinsic value of any business is going to be its discounted future cash flows. However, you know, we're cognizant of the fact that you know, often discounted cash flow models can be used to justify some you know, pretty lofty valuations by you know, forecasting 20 years out into the future. So we want to be a little more pragmatic than that. You know, I think if a business isn't obviously cheap uh, on a three to five year view using some more practical um, metrics like EV, EBIT, free cash flow yields, PEs, um, then there probably isn't a lot of margin of safety there. So you really want to think pragmatically, you know, simplistic, but if I'm buying, you know, what is far better than market business on a free cash flow yield equivalent to the market, you know, that's probably going to be an okay or a pretty good idea. Uh, so they're sort of the, the four factors that we look at. Um, and that's, you know, that's the process of filtering, you know, great businesses into the portfolio. I like how you, um, you made the point kind of using the phrase of the gateway being the, like the financial strength and then, you know, tipping through quality and, and management and, 
uh, then arriving at valuation, it, it's this like it's it's funny to see a lot of investors, like particularly you know um, newer investors, thinking that valuation is the f- at the forefront. It's like the the be all and end all. But obviously, when you take a long term approach as you do, um, you've got to put quality in front of valuation. How can you do a discounted cash flow analysis unless you truly understand the business? Um, small cap investing in Australia is kind of one of those areas where it's still like I believe it's still open to really strong active management and outperformance over the long term. But one of the catches that people perceive with small caps is obviously higher risk, right? Smaller companies, more volatility. So I'm curious how you manage that in the portfolio. Like how do you, we talk about like, maybe you could talk about like diversification or like risk factors or however you think about that framework of providing a good risk adjusted return. So focusing on the risk aspect of this. Yeah. So, you know, the way we think about risk um, you know, it always comes back to the investment process. Now, we've got a very disciplined investment process that really does focus a lot on downside protection. And, you know, I think we achieve that through really three measures. Um, you know, as I talked about, we only buy businesses with really strong financial strength. Uh, we buy quality businesses with really resilient and durable earnings. And we make sure we don't have a pay when we're buying those businesses. And I think if you take care of those three things, you really go a long way to protect the portfolio from um, you know, permanent losses of capital. Um, you know, I, it's true. Uh, the small odds index, there is a lot of junk in there. Um, but you know, I, when I think about it through the early lens, you know, our process means we avoid a lot of that speculative junk because you know we don't buy um, you know concept stocks with no earnings. We don't buy businesses with fatty products or opaque operating models, um, resource discovery plays or drug approval plays. You know, we really stick to what we can understand and what we can value, um, which means we sort of avoid a lot of that more speculative stuff. Mm, yeah. So your previous experience at KISS was a long short fund, which is, like I said, it's a little bit different um, to what you're doing now. Um, similarities, of course, in that you're investing in, in a similar way to what you were doing. Um, but you also talked about there being a lot of junk in the index. And I think a lot of people that look at small um, active managers and small caps see that as well so um is your i guess inability to go short like a missed opportunity could you be making money from shorting the junk yeah it's good um it's a good question yeah so back when i was at kiss um you know i was really fortunate enough to be given a, a sleeve of the portfolio um to manage uh which was you know a fantastic opportunity as a younger guy and um uh you know part of that experience was um shorting and you know, i think you learned some really invaluable lessons from shorting, particularly around the accounting. Um, you know, the best shorts that I ever found were always those businesses that were, you know, playing around with the accounts, doing some accounting shenanigans to try and, you know, artificially inflate statutory earnings. Um, you know, I'm one of the best shorts I found. I, I won't name it, but, um, you know, it was a business that was committing every sort of, you know, accounting sin under the sun, overcapitalization of expenses, um, you know, recognizing one off gains on acquisitions above the line to sort of, you know, meet management hurdles. Um, and, you know, I think I would never have, have discovered that if I, if I didn't understand accounting, if I didn't see the red flags in the accounts. Um, you know, accounting really teaches you that, you know, sometimes the statutory earnings that you see don't actually reflect economic reality. In terms of whether it's a, a missed opportunity, um, you know, the issue with um, shorting is that it takes a lot of time and, um, you know, your upside is limited and it's always going to be more valuable for me to go and find a really amazing long idea that can compound away for me for, you know, a decade than it is to find a, a short idea. So through that lens, I don't think it's it's necessarily a, a missed opportunity. And, you know, you get to use all those accounting tricks that you learn also on the long side. You know, it helps you see those red flags and um, and it limits those mistakes. You know, accounting really is the it's the language of finance. So if you don't have a good understanding of accounting, you're not going to be able to sort of derive the economic reality of a business. So yeah, I, I don't see it as a missed opportunity, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for that experience. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so at Rask, we're huge advocates of like core and satellite approaches. But I remember, like I've said this before on the podcast, so back in my days as a, as a fund research analyst where I just looked at um, funds and passive, active, all different types um, small caps were always like the favor of our analyst teams. Like if you asked any of the researchers what they invested in, it was like a collection of small cap funds, um, just because of all the things that we've talked about today. 
How do you see investors in the like using the fund longer term? Obviously, you've been around for a bit over a year. Performance is really good, um, but longer term, where does that fit in, a, in an investor's portfolio? You now, if you look at most Australian investors, um, you know they probably own a lot of, of blue chips. Um, you know, they've owned CBA and Telstra and Wesies for decades, and um, yeah, they've been great returners. Um, but you know, a good small cap manager can give you exposure to this. You know, fantastic you know, undiscovered gem that you've never heard of. It's got decades of growth ahead of it. Um, and I think the issue with small caps is that if you actually look at the index, it's not a great index. As we've discussed, you know, there's a lot of junk in there. If you actually go and look at the returns of the ASX 100 versus the small odds index over time, you know, the 100s comfortably outperformed it over most period. So if you do want exposure to the space, you really need to find a good active manager who can sort of sift through the weeds and you know, find those high quality opportunities. And, you know, we've been doing this for several years as a team. Obviously, the fund itself is is newer, but, um, you know, we've got a great track record of, of finding these great businesses and and finding that quality that's that's out in that wild west of speculative junk. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I just circle back to the portfolio question before? Um, how many positions are typical in the fund? Yeah, so... Um, 20 to 40 positions is typical, um, but, uh, you know, it's a very concentrated fund. You know, the top 15 names of the fund currently account for more than 75% of the portfolio. You know, we're really big believers in concentration. You know, I've talked a lot about finding undervalued quality, but in reality, it's quite rare to find a really good business trading at an attractive price. So, um, when you do find one of those ideas that you like, you really have to have a meaningful position in it, which is why you know the fund's so concentrated. So I'd say I think if there's 23 stocks in there today. Um, it'll oscillate between 20 and 40, but it's important to note that those top 15 are really what's going to sort of make and break the fund. Yeah, I like that. Um, it's actually I really like that because like I asked the question about like how many are in there, but it's not just about that, as you know. It's about weighting the positions and understanding how they move in, in tandem or not. Um, and I would refer people to the, the watching or listening to the early website. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can go and check out the latest monthly updates. And uh, you do list a few of the names and, and, and what have you in there, as well as like the, the, the sector breakdowns and, and, and people can have a good look at the fund. Um, now I've got two final questions. The next one's a bit like a bit of fun, a bit tongue in cheek. So we don't want to take this, like uh, we just talked about how the portfolio is diversified. And that said, you do like to have concentration. But like, if if I could just tease out the best idea from you, like a high conviction business, you don't have to. We're not saying it's not a recommendation or anything like this, but just a business. Let's stay with that. A business that is like high conviction. You really like the business model um, into the future. Yeah, I think um, an interesting one to talk about might be GenTrack. It's um, business that's been um, you know probably our best performer in the funds, um, and it's still a, a core holding and perhaps one that maybe your audience aren't that familiar with, so it might be a little more interesting. Um, Look, Gentrack, um, for those who don't know, it's a provider of enterprise software to the utilities and airport space. And, you know, really the lion's share of value there um, is in the um, utilities business. So that's what I'll, I'll really spend most of my time talking about. But, you know, we really like businesses that sell this type of mission-critical enterprise software because um, typically it comes with very low customer churn given how disruptive and costly it can be to switch providers. So you know, if you're a utility um, upgrading uh, your enterprise software might cost anywhere from fifty to two hundred million dollars, and take twelve to twenty-four months to implement. So it's this massive project, and that creates a lot of um, you know implementation risk. So it's the kind of thing that you really wants to do once every decade, um, which is then great for these software vendors because once you've won a customer, uh, you then lock them in for for ten years. So it creates these really sort of annuity style, uh, predictable, sticky revenues. Um, so it's a very durable business. Um, you know, Gentrack itself is a testament to this. The company's been around for more than 35 years, which is pretty unique for a, a small Aussie uh, or a small tech company. Um, in terms of the competitive landscape, so, um, you know, the market for enterprise software for utilities, um, there are the incumbents uh, who have around 75% shares, so that's SAP and Oracle. And then there are the uh, specialist players like Gentrack. And really the opportunity for Gentrack is that if you think about utilities in the energy market, you know, it's going, there's an immense amount of change that's happening. Um, you know, utilities um, and their systems 
having to deal with the the changing demands of the uh, energy transition and the energy grid is is gaining in complexity. Um, you know, you now have to deal with storage and generation that's been decentralized, things like smart meters, EVs, solar panels, dynamic pricing. There's a lot of added complexity in there, and that means that the systems that these utilities are operating on, many of which might be, you know, 25 years old, they're no longer fit for purpose and they need to be upgraded. Um, you know, SAP, for example, are actually end of lifeing their tech stack. So that means that their utility customers will have to make a decision. You either upgrade to the new SAP stack or you potentially go with a specialist provider like Gentrack. So there's this huge opportunity for, you know, a small, smaller provider like Gentrack to go and, you know, really gain a foothold in the market. That's the opportunity. Um, yeah, we've talked earlier about how you know it's quite difficult to find quality businesses that are cheap, and you know usually there has to be something that's, or often there has to be something that's gone wrong with the business that gives you that opportunity. In the case of Gentrack, um, you know it had a rough couple of years before we purchased a uh, stake in the business. Um, you know the company had been navigating some customer closures that were related to regulatory changes, uh, which has substantially reduced their profit margins. Um, you know, we looked at those issues as mostly temporary and we're happy to sort of add to our position on signs of a recovery in margins and, you know, some really strong underlying revenue growth. It's important to note that, you know, even during that dark period for the company, it still, you know, ticked off our financial strength uh, metric because the business had a very strong net cash balance sheet and again, some really resilient earnings that meant that even during that period, it was generating strong free cash flow. Um, so that's the uh, balance sheet. In terms of management quality, there was actually a change in management uh, that happened during that period. Um, they hired a new CEO, Gary Miles. You know, Gary's um, he's got a fantastic track record in enterprise software. He's founded two enterprise software businesses and subsequently sold them. The latter he sold to uh, Amdocs, which is the uh, world leader in telco enterprise software. They've got around 25% market share. That's a $10 billion NASDAQ listed business. And he held several you know, senior executive roles there um, after selling that business. So he then joined um, uh, Gentrack. Um, and, you know, we talked earlier about great managers. You know, Gary is obviously he knows the enterprise software space extremely well given his history and he's also extremely entrepreneurial. So, you know, public markets give you that opportunity to piggyback on, on great managers and we think Gary might be, might be one of those. Um, you know, a testament to his leadership. He's actually brought across quite a few of his his team members from Amdocs, which is really impressive given the difference in scale between those two businesses. Um, so big tick on management quality. In terms of valuation, um, you know, Gentrax had a great run, but you know, the business is still operating on pretty depressed margins. And you know, we think if you normalize for those margins, you know, if they go back towards historical levels, the business is only trading on something like 15 times EV EBIT, which you know, we think is a pretty modest price given the, um, you know, quality of the opportunity set ahead of the business as well as, um, you know, other quality software names on the ASX. Now, to be clear, I don't think margins are getting back to historical levels tomorrow. That might take, you know, several years. But I think it's important to think about it that way because it, it indicates or it illustrates, you know, the operating leverage that might be ahead of the business. Um, so, yeah, Gentrack's been, you know, a terrific performer, but it's one we're still really optimistic about and still a core holding the fund. Yeah, great. I um, I I remember I followed GenTrack for nearly ten years, I'd say now, and um, just seeing it like move through life in the UK, and then like the fragmentation and consolidation, and just different changes in the energy system. It's been a really interesting, um, I guess, few years for the watching the business, and um, I'm glad you brought that to the table. So, if I'm not mistaken, it still trades under the ticker symbol GTK for folks that want to pop it on their watch list. Uh, yeah. And uh, and go away and, and research this. Um, and I will refer everyone back to the the early website where you can find out more about Will um, and also what's inside the portfolio uh, and play along. Uh, mate, my final question, which I ask all new guests on the show, is a pretty it's a challenging one, but it can also be as simple as you like. Um, which is just that if you would go back in time and give yourself some advice, obviously you might say go and buy Amazon stock if you could exactly if you had a time machine, but if you could go back and tell yourself one thing about business, investing, it could be even just a life, whatever the case may be, if you could tell yourself one thing, what would it be? Yeah, it is a um, it is a tough question. You know, um, I think part of of you know learning is really going out and making 
those mistakes and learning from them. So I certainly wouldn't want to interrupt that process of of um, of making mistakes. But you know, I think um, you know the simple advice of 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 learning and um, and you know constantly trying to read and expand your your knowledge base. You know, investing is a very sort of um, you know holistic pursuit that takes in really from lots of different um, you know schools of study and thought. So I think the more you sort of expand your knowledge base, it really helps you later in life in investing. And you know, I think also um, you know investing is kind of unique in that like you're never you know there's no real finish line there. You're always getting better as an investor. Um, you know, I remember when I was younger, I looked back at myself you know 12 months earlier and think God, I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I think that's actually a healthy thing because at the end of the day, um, it shows that you're growing. And so, you know, I'd probably encourage um, encourage that and, and just, yeah, don't be dissuaded by that. That's that's a good sign and just, yeah, keep, keep ticking away. Mate, I actually really like that advice, um, the kind of multidisciplinary approach, but also, yeah, the the idea of looking back and, and if you cringe, it's probably a good thing. Um, you know, it's it probably means that you're giving it a crack and you and you were you were on that journey. So uh, that's that's wonderful as well. A good anecdote to finish the show with. I, I really do appreciate, mate, you you joining me. Um, I know you're you're a busy fella, so thank you for your time and and thanks for sharing some of your your insights. No, thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me. That's great. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.